Father, thank you so much for your grace, your unmerited favor, which you showed towards us and you demonstrated in sending your son. We are unworthy, Lord, of your love. We're unworthy of your strength and your grace, and yet you give it to us freely. I pray that you teach us with both arms to embrace you this morning and that your spirit might speak to each heart here today, that you would grow us up to be more like you, that you would help us to appreciate all that you have done, that our hearts might be thankful uh, even before we have a day celebrating it, Pray that you might be with us today, Lord, that you would teach us and grow us. Some of us, Lord, bring tremendous burdens here this morning. You know those things. I pray that in some small way today might be even a part of the answer to that. I pray, Lord, that you would be lifted up at this time that your word would be magnified and that we might become more profitable for you. So Lord, help us as we look at your word that you might unlock its secrets for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we're starting a new book and that's always exciting. If you know anything about starting a new book, it usually means that there'll be a long, long process of explaining what we're about to talk about but I won't do that. So <laughs> this is where we were. We were at the end of first Peter last time talking about at least one of the passages that we're to be alert because our adversary, the devil is roaming around like a, a lion seeking whom he may devour. And so we're to be sober and to be vigilant, to be on our toes and watch out for that. In fact, when Jesus explained to the disciples on how to pray, it was one of the things he said, you know, I have to go through the whole thing to remember it now. Isn't that in the shame? <laughs> Are you guys like that? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. So we ask God for protection from the evil one, just even as the, the, the rest of the scriptures explain. So this week, we're going to be in chapter two. By the way, you, you may notice that uh, the screen is gone and a TV's taken its place. It, it's much clearer, and uh, at least for you people in the middle. You guys already have yours. You have yours. Now they have theirs. So don't be jealous. <laughs> and we're just hoping more people sit in the middle. <laughs> Second Peter chapter one, uh, the highlight verse I have is verse 13 to 15. Peter saying this, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, speaking of his body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. He means die. Just as our Lord Jesus showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. This is actually a picture of the prison where he was kept in his final days. And so this second Peter is kind of like uh, the, the revelation of John, which is his last letter to us, and also Paul's letter to Timothy. His second letter is his last letter, and it's... Uh, it's one of those things when you're leaving a last will and testament, uh, you, you tend to say things that you don't normally say on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, because you want to make sure that you leave a lasting impression on those that you leave. And Peter's no different. And so beginning in verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a precious faith, a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So introducing himself, he tells us who he is. Now you're going to notice that this letter sounds a lot different than his first letter, but the circumstances have changed. Much like if you were writing a letter to someone and you knew that you were heading to a cross, 
which is where Peter was headed. He was heading to a cross. He wouldn't let them hang on that. He wouldn't let them hang him on that cross rightly because he didn't feel he was worthy to die in the same way as Jesus did. And so they hung him upside down while he was uh, coming out of prison in Rome. And so the tenor and everything of what he says is going to be different here. And people question his authorship because it has such a different feel. But it's because it's a different sort of an occasion. So Simon Peter, I, I love that because in First Peter, he introduces himself as Peter. He doesn't add the Simon part. You remember, he was named Simon. He was brought up Simon. And when Jesus met him, he says, you are Simon you shall be called Peter. It's interesting. You know when Peter actually became Peter? When he was doing the right things. <laughs> he was always Simon when he was messing around and he was being double-minded and he was being in the flesh. And when he wasn't and he was doing what the Lord wanted him to, he called him Peter. It's kind of interesting. Remember, Jesus said, you know, who do people say that I am? And he says, well, some people think that you're Jeremiah the prophet. Some of them think that you're, you know, uh, all of this. Well, and he goes, well, who do you say that I am? And, you know, that's the most important question, isn't it? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, because he's the mouthpiece of everyone who happens to be anywhere in the general vicinity, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you. Simon Barjona, it's interesting he calls him Simon, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. It's interesting because right after that he says, oh Lord, uh, don't go to the cross, that, that would be terrible. And he says, get behind me, Satan. So he called Simon, Simon, and he also called him Satan. It's interesting how we have that dual... Uh, personality, don't we? There's that evil, dark part of our flesh that we shouldn't put on and shouldn't wear. And then there's the spirit, which is what Christ has given to us through faith in him. And Peter doesn't talk like he does in his first letter. He calls himself Simon Peter, which is great. Peter means rock. So Jesus renamed him rock. You're going to, from now on, they're going to call you rock. Well, it's interesting. They, they call him Simon Peter because you never know what you're going to get, right? And I think Peter, towards the end of his life, was humble enough to remember his origins, remember where he came from, and he introduced himself as Simon Peter. You know, he became extremely popular uh, <laughs> when he denied the Lord three times publicly, and Peter is known for that, but he's also known for things like walking on water, He's known for being with Jesus on some of the most incredible times. In fact, he's going to mention it here when he was on the mountain, the mountain of transfiguration. It was Peter, James, and John who were with Jesus when all that happened. But Simon was always a guy who was sleeping when he should have been praying. He's always speaking when he should have been listening. You know, he, he, he always seemed to be doing the thing that he shouldn't have been doing. Uh, can you identify with that? You know, and and I just I just love Peter. I really identify with him because I tend to be a little on the impetuous side, and I have to really make sure that I rein that in and give it to the Lord and ask Him to either use it or or completely extinguish it. But He introduces Himself as Simon Peter, so I think in that there's a confirmation of His background. Don't ever forget where you come from, by the way. Um, I've been a Christian for a lot of years, and it's easy to forget that I was once lost. I was a criminal. I was a, a very angry person all the time. And it's easy to forget what Jesus saved you from. But when you remember where you were when Jesus met you and how he saved you, that, that's one of those things that makes you thankful. And it should never bring shame, because Jesus took the guilt of that, right? You don't bear that anymore. It went on him. It's double jeopardy if you try to punish yourself for it, right? Okay. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle. A bondservant, the, the word is doulos. A doulos is one who is a voluntary slave. Most slaves at this time were people who owed a debt. And what they did is they gave you years of their life 
and they said, well, I'm going to work this off in six years. On the seventh year, you were set free, so you can't make a debt any bigger than you could pay off in six years. That's a good idea, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Students should think about this. It would be a good idea. took me forever to pay that loan off. But he's talking about being an apostle and a bondservant, a doulos. A doulos is one who served a master for a period of time. He's set free. Your debt's paid. Everything's fine. And he says, listen, you're such a good master. I don't want to leave. I want to stay. I don't want to serve you for the rest of my life. And the master would say, okay, let's go. We got a little something to do. He brings you to the front door of the house. He takes an awl, which is a big pointy thing, puts it up against your ear and against the, the post and goes, poof and pierces your ear. Don't act like you didn't have this happen to you. <laughs> and they pop an earring in, and what that does is it symbolizes the fact that you have decided to be a volunteer to someone as master for the rest of your life. You're bound. That's what's called bond servant. And he's saying, that's what I am. I'm a bond servant. So other places he calls himself a slave, and if you look at the original language, it's actually doulos. It means I am a voluntary slave of Jesus Christ because God's not in the business of making slaves, but he is in the business of making children. And he calls us sons and daughters. And so we volunteer because he's such a good master. So he's Simon Peter. He's a bond servant and an apostle. An apostle is like, you know, somebody who's an emissary, represents someone else that goes out. Uh, we, you know, uh, President Trump, or almost President Trump, is picking people to be emissaries to various places, you know. Uh, so that, that's kind of neat to have somebody that's been sent out. But they go with the authority and the power of the commander-in-chief. You see, that's what an apostle is. It's a sent-out one, aposteo one who was sent out on behalf of another. And they don't carry their own message. They carry the message of the one whom they work for. So Simon Peter shows us both sides of who he is, a doulos, a bondservant, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you were to introduce yourself or write a letter, how would you introduce yourself? Hi. It's me. I, I knew a guy that used to pray that way. I thought it was so cool. Hey, Lord, it's me. It's Eddie. How are you? Yeah, he's so cool. Anyway, I digress. Of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you ever introduce yourself as that. Would you say, hi, my name is fill in the blank. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because you call yourself a Christian and nobody really knows what that means anymore. It's kind of been watered down. We had, we had a guy uh, who came to our house and was trying to sell us internet. And he says, uh, so what do you do? And I said, you'll never be able to guess. <laughs> I usually like to see them squirm a little. And so I told him I was a pastor. He goes, oh, really? My father goes to church. Swing and a miss. So, and of course, once he came in, my wife got to talk to him about the gospel and confront him with that. And he has a wife and he has kids. And it's like, well, what basis do you teach your kids? He goes, well, I just tell them I don't want them to do this thing because I don't want them to do it. Oh, you, you think that's enough, huh? You think that's going to do it? Just because I said so. Your parents ever do that? I said so. We get so many opportunities to share who we are in Jesus Christ and share our identity. And here Paul is introducing himself both as Simon and Peter, as a bondservant and an apostle. He's writing to people who would recognize him as an apostle, the eminent apostle, the spokesperson of the 12, the one who's the, the first pope, some people would say. Although this pope was married. To those who have obtained a like precious faith. So his audience is you and me. If you have a like precious faith. It's interesting because Peter, we know from history, was a big burly fisherman. He was a big dude. If you look in John chapter one, 21, when all of the other apostles could not, and the disciples couldn't pull in a net full of fish, 
Peter does it by himself. The dude's a tractor, okay? So he has no problem picking things up and putting things down. He's a big dude. And yet he uses the word precious. Uh, burly men in the room. How many of you use this word? <laughs> precious. It's interesting because he uses it many times here in the scripture, and I didn't get the number, but he uses the word precious faith. In other words, it is an inestimable value. That's what it means to be precious. Can't even put a number on it. Can't even put a, a dollar figure on it. And it's interesting here again, to those who obtained a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God. By the way, the only reason that you have faith and the only reason that you are righteous in God's sight is because of Jesus. Of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you notice that? Jesus is our God and Savior. That's exactly the way it reads in the original language, too. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says it that way first, and then the next way he says God and of the Lord Jesus, of Jesus our Lord. I just want you to see that it's Jesus is God, and it's attested to by the scriptures. He also is separate from God. Both are mentioned right here in this verse. So if you wanted to show somebody this duality, you could do it. It's right here. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. By the way, you're going to see lots of math terms. I think he, he, he went, you know, he was in the better grades when he was in high school. Because he's using multiply, add, he's using all these math things as we go through. Grace and peace. By the way, God's grace is his unmerited favor that he gives to us, which always brings peace. God's grace, which he gives to us freely in his son, is what we receive and we always get peace. Amen? In fact, if you're afraid, Scripture says God is not a God of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So where's that coming from? Not from God. Where does peace come from? It comes from God. And it comes from when we understand his grace, that he gave his only son for our lives. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. You're going to see the word knowledge mentioned 13 times in this little three-chapter epistle. So knowledge is a big thing. Now, some people are really up on knowledge. In fact, if you have, um, if you have very strong parenting, your parents will tell you, you've got to go to college. How many of you had parents that said, you've got to go to college? Yeah, because that's where you lose your faith, right? You got to go to college. You got to get an education. And then when you have four years, not nearly enough. You got to go get four more years. You got to get your doctor's degree. You get that and he's like, that's not nearly enough. You've got to have multiple degrees to be competing in this world. And by the time you're upward around, you know, $750,000 in debt, you won't be able to get a job. So... Knowledge is hugely important. Knowledge changes things, doesn't it? Knowledge is one of those things that will change the way that you see things. And as you increase in knowledge, you will hopefully increase in wisdom. That's why we read the scriptures, and that's, why, that's what we put up on the board. So, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. So the scripture says that by his divine power, he has given us, notice it's a done deal. It's not something that's coming in the future. It's not a heaven bound inheritance. It's something that's now. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Does that mean I can trust God to get me a Maserati? <laughs> well, do you need a Maserati to live? I don't think so. Life and godliness. He's going to meet your basic needs and your spiritual needs. What are your spiritual needs? I'm sure you have, I can see the lists over your heads forming. <laughs> you got some spiritual needs, don't you? God is the one who has already provided by his power that whatever it is that you need. He's already provided it. 
you just got to write a check for it. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That means that God is the power and the source and the answer and the provision for whatever it is that you're going through. Well, I thought it was my education. No, no, it's not that. I thought it was my really awesome upbringing. No, I thought it was because I've got a lot of money in the bank. Not at all. It's because he's the one. And when we learn this, boy, there are things that happen and I'm getting ahead of myself through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. There's something about knowing more about Jesus Christ that supplies our needs. That the power of God through the understanding, through the scriptures, supplies our needs. Have, how many of you found that to be true? Okay, the rest of you? We got some things to learn here today. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you whose son asks for bread? Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If then you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus is trying to reason with us and he says, don't you understand your heavenly father loves you? And he wants to provide you with your needs. He's not going to get all sarcastic on you. You ask for bread and he gives you a rock. Here, chomp on this for a bit. That's not a proper view of who God is. You see, he wants to meet our needs like a father does a child. And you could try to reason it away and you could try to, in your lack of faith, say, well, that, that can't be. Okay. Apparently you have to grow in faith, right? Because that's what the word says and I believe it. That's what Jesus said. You could take that to the bank, right? So if my needs are being provided, if there's something in the way, I need to have a conversation with him, right? If I have fears, if I have things where I'm all hung up, I need to talk to him about that. Because all those who ask, and all those who seek, and all those who knock, you know, how often do we take God up on his word? How often do we say, okay, God, here you go. I'll tell you what, I did this last night. Because I had an extremely busy day and things stacked on top of one another. And I had things that I had to do. And I was here up in the dark attic late at night running wires. And plus I had a message to, to put together. Plus I had other things going on in my life. You ever have one of those days where you just said, I have overcommitted, God help me. <laughs> and I'm, now I'm tired and I'm trying to get this message together. God, you got to help me here. And he's like, I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> because after you do something for a period of time, you can get into a rhythm. You say, I got this. I like riding a bike. I, I got this. I can do this. Well, watch this. I'm going to go up a curb. Watch this. I'm going to use the, the curb as a ramp. And, you know, I'm, you know, we have to be really careful that in our own strength that we don't try to manufacture things of the flesh. And I had a couple of moments last night where I was face down on my desk with my hands up in the air and I was just praying that God would give me inspiration. You know what? He did. But how often do we take God at his word and remember, hey, he is waiting there and by his power, he has supplied us with everything we need for life and godliness and we don't go and ask. Shame on us, right? Or just me. In Philippians 4, 19 and 20, it says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you believe that God will meet all your needs? Yes. Well, then why do we sweat it? And we do. I know I do. It's like, oh, no. 
My insurance went up. Oh, no. My taxes went up. Oh, no. Wait, my, my, my budget was working just fine until the government got in there. Budget was working good until all the eggs went through the roof and milk and everything else is expensive now. Meat? I, I like meat. <laughs> my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. Well, what are his riches in glory? Infinite. And yet we won't ask him. We'll do it on our own. I'll, I'll do it myself. I was actually thinking about bringing this TV down all by myself. It's only 212 pounds on the top of a ladder. 62-year-old man, insane. So, <laughs> praise God because he shall supply all your need. And what he has done in the past for others, he will do for you. It's not an exclusive club where you're on the outside. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. In other words, we all share the same sort of stuff. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Aren't you glad that not only does God provide for all of your needs, but he also in his mercy will withhold you from being tempted to a place where he's absolutely sure you're going to lose it. Which means anytime we lose it, it's not on him. It's on us, right? But he is the one who protects us. Not just does he provide for us, but he also protects. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. I mean, I feel like at any day a house could fall on my head like Dorothy, right? <laughs> and yet God is good. God is good. And he is faithful. Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have been given promises. By the way, when people make promises, eh, it might happen. And you have to base whether you're going to trust their promises on their character and their past performance, right? Or no, no, you don't do that. You just believe everybody? Oh, got a bridge I want to sell you. Can you trust when God makes a promise? Oh, yeah. Do you think the devil wants to attack you and say, no, nah, no, nah, that promise isn't for you. It's for everybody else, it's not for you. You ever get that? You're a special case. You're, you're on the outside. Oh, these people are, you know, Billy Graham and, you know, John MacArthur and, you know, David Jeremiah, they're on the inside track. I mean, those promises apply to them, but not you. Oh, yeah, it does. Because God is not a, a favorite picker. I'm going to put that in the most common language I can. He's given us exceedingly great and precious promises. I'm going to remind you of a few. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus said, I'm giving you peace, so don't be afraid. The part that we have to do is to not be afraid. The part that he has to do is he's the one who gives us peace. But we got to stop, you know, we got to stop banging our heads on the wall. <laughs> saying, God, give me peace. Bam, bam. Well, maybe you should cut that out first. We'll get you you know, sewn up and squared away and imagine that. And God will take care of and give you peace. And God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. We just saw that in Philippians 4.19. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah chapter 40. It doesn't mean that you have all that stamina. It means that he does. Right? Those who hope in the Lord. You ever get to the end of your rope on your last nerve? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's called Monday morning. 
<laughs> you know. If I hope in the Lord, he's going to renew my strength and I will mount up on wings like eagles. I don't know about you, but like I have dreams about flying, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the idiom that's used. So if you feel weighed down, you feel like you're carrying a bunch of bowling balls on your back, you want your strength renewed, what are you going to do? Get another cup of coffee. <laughs> no. I think I need a vitamin, something I'm deficient in. No, why don't you go to the Lord? Hope in the Lord, and he will, you will mount up on wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not be faint. Even young men can't do that. But Jesus can enable you to do that. If you take him at his word, if you trust him, and if you go to him. But you see, that's because he promised it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. You feel like you're walking a crooked path. You don't know where you're going. It doesn't seem like you know where you're, what your ultimate destination is. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That's easier said than done, isn't it? And lean not on your own understanding. Well, well then how am I supposed to make a decision? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. You see, we're all about taking direction, not about running in our own direction. Our life is not about us. It's about him. It's about serving him, and that's where the real joy is. Amen? Amen. It's in doing the things the Lord would have us do. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I mean, you might have an especially evil neighbor. I'm getting you to think about it. <laughs> you might have an especially evil coworker. Do you know? It might be that they could get saved. I have seen people who were like my arch enemies give their heart to Christ and become a new person because of Jesus. There is no one excluded. There is no one that is so far gone. If, if there was one, it would be me or the Apostle Paul who said he was the worst of sinners. And yet God saved him. He was a murderer. God saved him. Look at Moses, a murderer. God saved him. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you really believe that scripture, you won't doubt your salvation, will you? If you really believe that scripture, you won't doubt your salvation. How many of you ever doubt your salvation? I'm going to raise my hand. You see, it's a faith problem. It's the sin that so easily entangles us, Right? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts chapter 16. Could it be that simple? I mean, don't I have to like knock on so many doors? Don't I have to, you know, do enough good things? Don't I have to clean up my language and not say words that I shouldn't say when people cut me off? I mean, doesn't that get me into heaven? <laughs> Or maybe it's church attendance. You know, you got to be here early and you got to leave late and you got to serve in the most strenuous possible ways. Is that what's going to make it into heaven? Is that it? I mean, loving people, being unconditional in your love, letting them beat you up and you say, God bless you. <laughs> and that's going to get you into heaven? It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ that he did the finished work that we can't do. If you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, period. Romans 10, 9. How many of you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord? You shall be saved, period. That's what it says. You believe that? Yes. I hope you do, because it's the truth. I didn't write this book. <laughs> you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. It's not a casual, hey, God, could you do this for me? Thanks. And you move on with your day. 
you will, when you seek me, seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. That's a promise. That's a precious promise. And it's a precious promise where it says that we enter into a divine nature. Because we believe these things, we enter into salvation by faith. And we're able to participate in the divine nature. In other words, you're remade to be like God. You're never going to be God. But you become like him. Because every student becomes like his teacher. Here's a whole bunch of other scriptures. Here. Here. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I feel like God is far away. He doesn't hear my prayers. And I feel like I've been far away from him for a long time. Where did he go? He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He didn't go anywhere. Where'd you go? That might be the question to ask. I will never leave you or forsake you. Because when Jesus makes a commitment to you, he keeps his promises. When you make a commitment to him, you fall down a million times. Trust me. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through the deep water, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty... You will not drown. When you walk through the fire of opposition, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Isaiah 43. If you're facing some difficulty, some hardship, the Lord goes with you. I mean, if we learn anything from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know that when we're doing God's bidding, we're going to do his, we're his people, he's going to be there with us in the fire. We can trust that he'll be there. So whatever difficulty it is that you have, you have no reason to be afraid because the promises of God are yes and amen. Ephesians 2, 8, and 10. For by grace you have been saved. By the way, you're saved from your sin. You're saved from yourself. You're saved from eternal damnation. You're saved. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, because if it was about me, I would definitely tell you, well, I, I did this. I walked an aisle. I said a prayer. I got a Bible from Billy Graham. That doesn't make you saved. What does? It's God's grace through faith. And it's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. You didn't manufacture it, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. We are the ones that he creates, his poema. Created in Christ Jesus for good works of which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Did you know God prepared things in advance that you should do? He must know everything. (laughs) Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. 2 Corinthians 5. 17. It's my old eyes. I can't read. And I don't have that one memorized. Do you get the idea? It's these precious promises by which we become partakers of the divine nature. You want to change at your very core? It's the promises of God. That's what this passage says. And so if I don't know the promises of God, I am going to escape being able to walk in this newness of life and living according to my new nature that God has enabled me to be in. And instead of being a butterfly that can fly, I'm just going to crawl around on the ground like a dumb butterfly. I don't want to do that. New creation. You're a new species entirely. Boy, I had so many comments. Verse 4, by which we've been given these exceedingly great and precious promises. There's that precious thing again, big, giant, burly fisherman using that word. That through these may be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped. That's a Ford escape, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. You, you haven't escaped. But you've escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. 
Notice the past tense of how it's written. You have escaped. It's not you will escape, you're eventually escaped, you're slowly escaping. Escaped. I just want you to realize these words are important, and I believe they're all put here by God in just the order they're supposed to and just the way they are. You have escaped corruption. By the way, the scripture teaches that the soul that sins must die. And it says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those are promises. And I hold on to those promises because my eternity is bet on those promises. And so is yours. And so I hold on to them. We've escaped through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, by the way, that's something that we have to add to. And here he is with another math term. Add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Okay, 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 all right. You want me to do all of that stuff. I got it. You know, I read it on first reading. I'm like, okay, okay, all right. So now that I'm saved, I got I to gotta add. Oh, man. How many of you feel burdened reading that passage? I, I do. I, I got to add to my faith. Add to my faith? Add to my faith. That means there's a response of my heart that I have to add to my faith. Faith is a gift of God. It's by grace, right? Or else I can't boast. But I'm supposed to add to my faith. Okay. What do I got to add to my faith? Well, there are these interesting steps. Virtue. You guys know what virtue is? It's actually valor. It's doing things that are admirable. You say, man, that's a good thing that person's doing. They're doing that's a good thing. So virtue is when you live your life and you're doing good stuff. So add to your faith some good stuff. Make sure it's coming out of you and it's not just a testimony. It's not just words. I'm a Christian. Hallelujah. You know, that doesn't mean much if your life doesn't reflect it. So add virtue. Do some good stuff. By the way, God has gifted you and equipped you to do certain things. Are you doing them? He's equipped you to serve the body of Christ. The scripture says so. <coughs> it's not just a pastor salesman's pitch. God has gifted you, and you're going to be uniquely able to do things that I can't do. What do you mean you can't do? I can't do. I'm not equipped for it. I'm going to add virtue to my faith. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins, and I'm saved. So you know what I'm going to do? In response, out of a thankful heart and out of love for him, I'm going to do good stuff. It doesn't get me saved. I do it because I'm saved. Make sense? Virtue, knowledge, which means I'm going to be in the word of God and I'm going to be reading and I'm going to go, I'm going to listen to people online. And I'm going to be in the word and spend the time with the Lord. And I'm going to add to my faith and to my virtue knowledge. So I'm going to know some things because the more that you know, especially about the Lord Jesus Christ, the better off you're going to be. And you enter into that divine nature, Right. And then you're walking in the spirit instead of the flesh. And naturally things are coming out of you that wouldn't otherwise come out of you. So add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control. Why is self-control after knowledge? Because knowledge puffs up, doesn't it? I, I mean, I, I know people that are so full of the word of God that they can't even speak a conversation with you unless they're quoting a scripture. And if they can't find one that fits, they'll, they'll, they'll find one that doesn't fit, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> because knowledge is one of those things that you want to pat yourself on the back, and you want everybody to know, hey, listen, I know this thing, and I know this other thing. And here, give me an hour. I'll tell you the rest of the things I know. Have some self-control. <laughs> with your knowledge, with your newfound information, that new infound. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, yeah, the Lord just spoke something to my heart, and he told me to tell you. Really? He's got my number. I mean, I'm surprised he would tell you and make it public. Maybe he was telling you. 
And sometimes when we learn things in the word of God, it's like, oh, 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 I got to go tell this. I got to go tell this person this thing. Because this thing. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe you should eat it first. <laughs> Maybe you should see if it lines up. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I got it. You see, self-control. With this new knowledge, you've got your faith, you've got your virtue, you've got knowledge. Self-control. You know, you don't have to say everything you know to everyone you know. Perhaps you have not met these people. <laughs> people that tell everything they know, whether it's private or not, whether it's someone you don't even know. And, and you know, let me tell you about my aunt's friend's cousin. Why? <laughs> well, just just because I, I find it interesting. Well, that's good. You should find that interesting all by yourself. Because I really I, I gotta go. I'm late for work. Do I really need to hear the story? Have a little self-control with your knowledge and be careful that you don't spread things you shouldn't. Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance. In other words, you know, you can do really, really good for a little while and then... Any of you feeling that? I mean, you know, boy, I'm go I got it. It's the new year. It's January 1. I'm in a word. I got a plan. I'm going to read five chapters. And, you know, how long does that last? Uh, uh, Mephibosheth and uh, uh, Melchizedek and uh, 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 I can't even pronounce ah, you close the book perseverance is important perseverance doing doing the right thing and continuing to do the right thing and showing self control and gathering knowledge and all of these things persevering in these things is something that's really hard I mean how many people join and say, I'm going to run the New York Marathon as soon as I'm done cig this cigarette. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to make it. You don't have what it takes. But you see, when the Lord is the one who supplies your need, and he's the one who puts you on eagle's wings, and he's the one who you will run and not grow weary, you won't faint, you know, God is the one who supplies, then you can do that. But you can't do it in your flesh. So what do we add to our faith? Virtue, good stuff. Knowledge, information. Self-control, which means you don't spread everything everywhere with everyone. Perseverance means you keep going. You don't stop. You don't quit. The Lord's speaking to my heart right now about something I need to persevere in. Actually, I have to start all over again. Godliness, which is doing what God does. Doing what God does, doing what God does? You know what God does mostly with me? Forgive. Show grace. Be patient. That's mostly what God does with me. Godliness, kindness. By the way, kindness is always toward other people. Godliness is always before God. Kindness is always towards other people. Kindness. Like... Uh, I'm going to make myself a cup of coffee. Can I get you one? And I make yours first. That's kindness. It's a small thing. Don't forget to be kind to other people. Don't forget other people are important to God. And show your love towards them. Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, kindness. Brotherly kindness, by the way, so it's to one another. And then love. Love is the goal, right? Love is the bottom line. It is unconditional where everything that you do, you are a resource for all others, but especially for the Lord. Lord, what do you want for me to do? So this is the progression. Don't just say, yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Well, that's great. Well, how did it change your life? Well, really not at all. <laughs> well, why don't you add to your faith some virtue and then some knowledge and then some self-control? You get the idea? And the degree in which we're willing to take God at his word is the degree in which we will grow. Make sense? Well, I am way out of time and way over prepared, so forgive me. I'm going to let the worship team come up. Add to your faith these things. And you may find that it's a progression and you're somewhere on this list. 
figure out what more you can do for the Lord, right? 